Hello and welcome to our Christmas Q&A. Uh, this is now, I don't know how many times we've done this now, but uh, I really enjoy this. It's just a fun time to, you know, not be so serious. I know sometimes these can get so deep and serious and I guess we'll see what it does, but uh, just love to be able to spend time with you all and answer some questions. Um, I'm happy to, you know, answer whatever. Um, I am just here to support and uh, hold space. I've had some questions sent by email. Uh, I've also, also, as you all know, I would love for you to share um, if you want to speak or if you want to put your questions in the comments and we will go from there. Um, very good. So I think actually I'm going to start with the question that is on uh, that someone emailed to me. Um, this question comes from Linda Richard. And her question was, well, this is just, I'll just read what she said. It's kind of short and sweet. She said, hello, Josh, I've heard you speak at the summit and several podcasts, and you often refer to the terms heart horse or space horse. And I think there may be other terms you use to describe the different types of horse personalities. Can you explain what is meant by these terms, please? Thank you. And Merry Christmas, Linda. All right. Well, that's awesome. Um, so there's kind of a couple things going on there. Um, when I refer to heart horse, that's just a little bit different than the terms around space, mind, space, and pressure. But I'm happy to talk about both of them. So a heart horse is um, can be a bit broad, but the a heart horse is one of those horses that just gets right inside you. Um, this could be your own horse. It could be a horse that you have spent time with and just seem to get right in there. Um, I was richly blessed um, with by a mare uh, that some of you may have seen. We actually got it on video when I was working with her and her owner. And, and I had actually um, felt connected in a way where I actually was able to share how she felt. And she just stepped towards me and buried her head in my chest. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that one, but I could, I, I honestly, it made, made me start to cry. I couldn't even hold myself together because it was just so rich and so pure. And, and she just felt so heard. And, you know, sometimes horses will feel heard and you'll just see them relax, but she just took it, you know, way up the scale and, and just poured herself into me. And it, that was just so rich. So that that's kind of a hard horse connection. So I've had heart kind of heart horse moments with horses that are not necessarily my own. Um, and um, but but uh, but the other side of the heart horses are are just these horses that have just they just get inside you and they have an impact on your life and they just seem to change. They change you because of the relationship that they lay out there for you to be a part of, whether that's that they hold space for you, whether that's that they help you grow, but somehow you feel a deeper connection to them. Um, than maybe other horses. And they've just set the stage for you to feel safe, to grow, to feel love, to, to feel a depth that you just haven't touched in life, maybe in certain areas, and they just leave a mark on you. So hard horses are, are these horses that have this ability to just kind of get right in and, um, and just help you grow, um, help you change, feel your heart loved, all of these pieces. Um, and then moving into horses, this mind, space, and pressure. Um, I, I try not to overgeneralize, but I find that when you're thinking of a horse's needs, a lot of the times when, when any of us are struggling, there's generally a piece, a need that's kind of maybe missing, a need that's not being fulfilled, something we're, we're struggling to grasp or understand within ourselves. Um, and what I've observed with horses is that there are horses that can have a variety of, um, of needs and my mind, space and pressure are kind of some of the needs that I talk to in a working way with our horses. And a mind horse is a horse that's very, very mentally involved in everything. They take everything in. They're very inquisitive. They can be very curious. They're going to be the first ones to see the horizon. They're always on the lookout when they struggle, they, they may be more of a kind of a herd bound issue. You would see them show their insecurities by desiring to have the herd back. Um, you know, separation anxiety can be a, a real big thing for a horse that's more mind-based in their needs. 
Um, and they really need to understand things. If a mind horse doesn't understand what is required of them, they will they will struggle. They will become tense and anxious. So so a mind horse needs us to communicate clearly with them and really help them understand how to take care of their environment. They need space held for them on these levels so that they can feel um, clear with what's going on for them mentally. Um, a space horse is a horse that will engage you differently. They are generally not nearly the same level of sensitivity and responsiveness um, to the world, but they will interact with you and they will interact with you spatially. And I find space horses generally get a bad rap because of the broad generalization that a horse pushing into your space is a negative thing and they should be sent out of your space. Um, space horses honor you with connection and they're always reaching for it. And the challenge with humans is that we, because of so many pieces in life, have closed up and become um, you know, spatially small um, for so many reasons. But what a space horse is doing is reaching for the edge of you. They're reaching to feel you and cause you to connect. Um, so as soon as you can drop the perspective that a, that a space horse reaching into you is a negative, but is actually gifting you with the ability to awaken your sense of connection, now you can all, all of a sudden engage with a space horse. So if a space horse can feel you outside of your body, then they have no need to engage you any further because they're just looking for the connection. So space horses are generally these horses that will engage you with their space. They will seem like they can tolerate more things. They don't get spooked or riled up the same way. And they seem to have this ability to kind of absorb things, but they're looking to feel everything in the world and they do it through their space. Um, but they generally will get the worst rap because, because, because of this overshadowing concept that anytime a horse pushes into your space, they're being disrespectful or bad. Um, and this is a real hard thing for a space horse. Could you imagine that your way of communicating or connecting was always interpreted as a negative, that every time you reached for someone, it, they, you were always pushed away. And this is generally what happens to space horses is that they get this kind of rap and they're not allowed to connect and it really messes with them. So I just love setting this tone of, of, you know, if you when you see these horses that are trying to connect like this, help them connect, show up in the conversation and really let them feel you. And the more you can allow that to happen, the more they have to interact with you. And all of a sudden, they um, their that need becomes met, and all of a sudden, a space horse can be at peace. So that's that's more of the space horse side. Um, a lot of times, people will like space horses because they will handle a lot. You know, you can take a space horse into a group of a thousand cows and they generally don't care too much. They'll walk down the trail and they won't be spooked, but they also might not be as responsive and snappy in their movements because they are more absorbers. They really feel the space and they absorb it and they're not overreactive. So sometimes people would prefer that quality, but every one of these kind of has, I wouldn't say a pro and a con, but it has things that favor different circumstance. Um, and then we have um, the pressure horse. And the pressure horse is a horse that is very, very sensitive to pressures. They, they feel pressures. These would generally be horses that we would observe as spooky. They get worried. They would be on alert. You know, when you're walking down a narrow trail, they would be uncertain about that. Um, generally, the, the, a lot of horses can be bred that way because they can actually be super refined in their cues. But boy, do you have to be detailed or what they become is they become super responsive to their fears. And so then a lot of times you'll see that if you don't settle the need for them to understand their world, now they all of a sudden become super sensitive to keeping themselves safe. And this is how pressure horses can actually become dangerous because we're not bringing peace to that need. So on one hand, a, a pressure horse um, can be very spooky or worried, but on the other hand, my goodness, can they be so sensitive to the most subtle cues and they can get so connected with you, but you have to earn it with them. And so then I spend a lot of time helping pressure horses understand relational ways to control the pressure so that they can feel safe. Because if I don't give them other options, they will generally, because they come to us, if they're in a self-preserving state, they're very sensitive to keeping themselves safe. And that's very hard for any of us, if we're in that state, to have any deep relationship. So by meeting that need first and really helping them with that, now they can, they can calm their senses and they can then be in relationship. 
So the first part of this is, is for us to be able to set that tone for our horses so that we can help them. And now every horse can be a mix of these things. You know, some horses are, you know, pressure and mind. Those things will come together often. Not generally will you get a space pressure combination. That's not generally because generally space horses absorb a lot and the pressure horses are really responsive. Um, sometimes it's happened. Um, you can get space and mind horses. And so, and you can also have horses that are kind of equal on all of these things. When it's hard to tell what they are is when they're really okay in themselves. Okay. Some of, I have a couple of horses that are, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty okay. And you wouldn't tell. So some of you know, my max horse, he's, he's kind of my main guy. Um, he's really a pillar in our herd all the horses want to be around him um and he is a super sensitive pressure horse but you would never know it by the way he exists because he has developed a level of confidence within himself to be able to satisfy that need now is he very responsive in the work absolutely um he's very sensitive but he's not fearful um so then anyways this is still a play a very positive thing in our relationship but it's not something that brings up fear the same way so that's really a fun thing. So I just want to say, I actually have a little, uh, you know, it's just a general question and answer piece where you can go through on the website where you can kind of answer some questions to kind of get a little bit of a sense of your own horses. It's just for fun. Um, again, I don't want to pigeonhole, but if you can really recognize that each of these things are just needs that your horses have, and that if you can meet that need, it allows them the opportunity to be in a deeper relationship. The challenge with horses and people is that the horses didn't come to us and say, you want to go and hang out like you want to go and do this um what the horses do is they're ready they're okay and open but it's a little bit like we're going into their deal so then from that perspective we we need to be willing to earn earn them we need to be willing to put ourselves into a position where we can set the tone where they can feel comfortable with us and then that relationship starts to grow where it becomes a little bit more mutual um but i just love the idea of you know, it's, it's okay for us to not just expect the horses all the time to just do what we want. They don't mind doing the things that we want to do, but they really have a hard time when they're doing it, when, when we're asking that and they don't feel safe. So by meeting their needs, it allows for just a beautiful conversation. And I don't see that different for any creature on the earth, which again, makes it very relational as a, as a perspective, not just as a horsemanship um, presentation. All right. So um, I see that Carrie has her hand up. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Josh. How are you? Hey, everybody. Um, okay, so just as we were, as you were beginning today, and, and Merry Christmas, by the way, and thank yeah, you Merry for Christmas sharing too. so much. Um, just as we were starting up, I was actually on the phone with a client in Vermont who walks um in a really special way in the world she's got a mm. foot still in conventional horsemanship she mm -hmm. owns this amazing beautiful facility in vermont has 33 horses or something mm. under her care mm -hmm. and um sometimes it comes up that a horse is they decide they're going to find a new home for this mm. horse mm -hmm. they um have, she's had the experience several times now where there's a horse that doesn't Put a foot wrong they know their job they're beautiful they get it because of how she works with them mm -hmm. in her world from her mm -hmm. heart through mm -hmm. through connection mm -hmm. but then of course the horse goes to somebody else mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it looks like it's the horse's problem the horse mm -hmm. starts biting blah 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 mm -hmm. and she spends hours trying to educate people mm -hmm and say there's a different way to approach this horse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Da, 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 but the person's in another state and da, mm -hmm. da, da, da. Yeah. So she, you know, she, our, our conversation will continue, she and I, mm -hmm. but I thought it would be wonderful to ask your thoughts as well. Mm. You know, um, how do we, as a community and you and I in our positions, but mm -hmm. all of us touch people mm -hmm. in, you know, how, how do we continue to um, share a different way of being mm -hmm. without, you know, being insular Mm -hmm. and closed off in mm -hmm. our world that mm -hmm. is operates from connection mm -hmm. um, but how but also not judge and blame yeah people for where they're at right. in their world of education so mm -hmm. i wonder if you might just share your thoughts and speak to that a little bit and um, cool. i thought it would be beautiful to hear you speak to that yeah that's awesome 
uh, such a big deal, such a big deal, because uh, on one hand, we are their guardians. And as we start to be in deeper relationships with them, they feel more comfortable to be a part of the conversation and share how they feel. And then we interact with that. And then there's this healthy dynamic. So they feel the the validity in their voice. They feel the validity to be able to be in interaction. And the challenge in uh, certain worlds is that anytime the horses interact with us, it's observed as disobedience or disrespect and, and no different than any healthy relationship. Healthy relationships uh, allow the beauty of opinion and perspective and shared space where we would share and engage with each other. And it wouldn't be observed as disrespectful or, you know, uh, um, confrontational. It's just voice and we're just sharing and it's beautiful. Um, the challenge in our world is that that the horses have been pigeonholed into any time they speak. It's not. And, it, and when it's not doing what we want, it's disobedience and disrespect. And this is one of the biggest challenges. So, so for me personally, I think it's a little bit about changing the form of how we go about um, rehoming horses because um, the, the challenge we see is that we're actually still processing it in a conventional matter. At manner. We put the horses up and then somebody comes and it's like, okay, it kind of works. And then we, we let the horse go. Um, so for me, and I, this is where I can really share how I've done it, um, because this was one of the reasons I got away from training for the public because it was just people coming in and I was working their horse and they would go home and we would run into these types of issues, uh, which was what got me teaching. But also what it did is it got me training my own horses and then building transition with my students. So I would train a horse and then the horses would go to people that were more trying to commit to this approach so that the horses could be heard. Um, the biggest challenge is if we want horses to not talk, then we have to make them submit. And this is the great challenge. You have to make the horse stop having a voice. And this is the great conundrum of training is, is if they're not allowed to have an opinion that, and, and we have to kind of screw them down until they stop talking. You see, this is the great trainer. This this is what I call the trainer's challenge, you know, um, because we have to educate. It's so important that we educate. Um, so I feel like the middle ground is that I don't want to make judgments at all, but I also want to make sure that I'm engaging the people that are buying the horses. For me, um, selling the horses, number one, is going to be partly engaging with the people in a way where where it's really clear that they're going to have the support and they're going to kind of follow along in a way where the horse is going to be heard and seen. They don't have to do the same thing. It doesn't matter to me at all, but that they're committing to that. They're kind of committing to it and they're showing and demonstrating that as they do that, they're seeing it and feeling it and understanding it so that there's that. And when we can focus on that, then we grow from there. Um, so, so that's been really, and it, it does, it, it, the, initially people believe that it's going to narrow down the clientele. It's going to narrow down the clientele as we're trying to sell horses. But what I found is it actually inspires that you draw those people out of the woodwork. You, you, those people start to seek you and, and draw to you to find those types of situations and connections. And that's what I found. I, I would, I would, um, it would come by feel to me with the people and they would start to show up and I would entrust when I really felt connected to a thing, then I would just trust it and we would move forward. Um, so, so number one, it has to first resonate that the people are really striving towards a desire to relate to the horses in that way. And then secondly, that they're also committed to the learning process so that I could mentor them. So for me, like it, it would be from anywhere. I've had some quick transitions, but it can go from anywhere between, you know, two weeks to six months, depending on the connection, depending on how well the connection happens. And in the end, it's all based on feel. It's like, it has to, you have to sense the horse and feel that kind of connection. And um, because it, because again, that's the challenge. We are their guardians. We are, we are representing and protecting them. And, and that doesn't mean we have to hang on to them. That's not protection. That that's sometimes small minded thinking that no one will treat them as well as me. Uh, I really, I really struggle with that thought actually, because um there's a lot of times, and I've sold a lot of horses to places where people were going to do more than I could do because I didn't 
you know, I have some horses, I have too many horses or not too many. I have enough horses where you're spread thin, you're teaching clinics, you're doing this and someone else could take that horse and make them their horse and, and just bloom. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly if that answers it, but there's kind of a couple pieces to that puzzle. Does that make sense, Carrie? Yeah, it totally does. And if nothing else, I think it's it's worth it to keep the conversation going so there's mm -hmm. camaraderie among people right. who are in that totally. position totally. that you, know, you have to rehome some horses and yeah. you cannot control mm -hmm. even if you have a good feeling and the people mm -hmm. are like mm -hmm. yes I'm totally committed to the learning and then mm -hmm. two and a half months down the line the horse gets nippy and the mm -hmm. people don't want a nippy horse and the the, the education there's a gap there's a, mm -hmm. an opportunity for education the person like might not see that as an opportunity for exactly the reasons mm -hmm. you're saying because yeah. we want the horse to not do it sure and and those are the moments of of real commitment am mm -hmm. i committed what what mm -hmm. am i really committed to you know it, it, yeah. i just bought this horse and it is absolutely an evolutionary curve it's mm -hmm. not it's beyond a learning curve it's an yeah. evolutionary yeah. curve for humanity at mm -hmm. this point yeah to look through a different lens right and um and josh did you ever um buy horses back that went to a place mm -hmm. that you know the horse was not being served and so you said you know what then i will just buy him back and we'll look for a different situation or did you um, just offer education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i i don't know if that ever did happen but but offering support has is always has always been to the best of our ability. We would do everything in our power to try to support. Um, uh, and I think that the the most valuable piece is trying to some. This is a thing for me that I've been spending a lot more time on. Is that generally we we want everything to be good. We want everything to just kind of be good. And as as you and I. No, with our snow globe thing, a lot of times the snow gets shook, but the snow globe shaking is often purposeful and pointed. And there's a lot of times where if we if we don't let that happen, that process happen, and m maybe the horse has to nip awake that person. As crazy as that seems, we want it to stop and we want everything to behave and to be just right. But sometimes those are the things that actually awaken and and now we live in a world where it's very easy to just trade relationships you know like to just no i don't like that it's not good enough for me or it's not what i want and i get that like sometimes that is okay but a lot of times as we and trust if it feels right like it felt so right when we went through the process now i will support but i will also try to support the energy of the horse in continue finding the way to do what you're doing because you're actually trying to awaken something in that person that's going to cause them to be different. And it just means them kind of working through it. Now it might be ugly and it might not be pretty, but horses, horses are so versatile. They're so capable of handling. Like I'm sitting here and it's very cold and my horses are happily eating hay. They have the ability and the tenacity to handle things in a different way. And they don't have the same cerebral connection to certain things. And I observed that they're able to recognize purpose and go into it, recognize almost like they can see the end before we can, or they can see what they're doing in a different way. It's, it's mysterious and beautiful in the same sentence. Um, so sometimes it's like, I will trust what the horse is doing. I will trust that process, but the trainer in us, oh, we just want everything to shut down. We want everything to look right. We want the person to have fun and have no troubles, but then we're not growing, you know, and this is, I, I'm observing this with my daughter's basketball team. You know, they're really working at it and there's some qualities and there's things they need to work at and they want to win and, and I get it, but I actually want them to lose because I want them to learn and I want them to understand. And do I want them to win? Sure I do but I also want them to lose because that really brings up a different learning. So anyways, it's kind of the same. It's like sometimes that awakens something and the horses are magicians for this. And we generally want everything to be good and happy and quiet when sometimes they're up to stuff. So uh, it's always hard to know, but I find myself 
sometimes lost in the process. And then afterwards, all of a sudden, this person breaks down and asks the question, why is this happening? This is happening here and this is happening here. And why is it that there's, th-? you know, it's like, but, oh, there it is. Now, now we see it. <laughs> and that was what the horse was working on because they're working on a different frequency. And we just, you know, want to get on and go for a trail ride. Well, part of us does, but most of us desires to really awaken the deeper elements of our own ability to be in relationship and horses say, okay, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we could go on and on, oh, but I'm totally going to close it there and thank let you move on to someone else's, but thank you so much for speaking to it, Josh. You're welcome. Okay, Maya, um, you have a few questions there. Yeah, so um, I'm just recovering from a cold, so my voice okay. probably sounds like really croaky. Uh, so bear with me. So Shannon asks, what are some things you like to play with with your horses in the winter when mm. you don't have space to work slash good footing, mm. i.e. no ex- no access to indoors? Mm-hmm. I love riding in the snow. It's one of my favorite things. Um, you know, the horses move different and they're very buoyant and they engage. And, you know, I, I had, uh, I still remember this. That was one of the most, just one of the funnest things ever. Um, I had a Parisian mare in for training and she was the richest, most beautiful black horse at, with the longest, most beautiful tail. And we had like a foot and a half of snow. And when she would canter, she would just sit down and her tail would drag out on the snow. And I, I just thought, so, so we would canter around and took some pictures and it was just so fun. And she would love it because she would just lift. And, you know, so to me, I find uh, it's just a beautiful challenge to just go and play in the snow and, and the footing. I, so this is maybe a cowboy thing. And I really culture my horses around them becoming sure-footed because a lot of times we debilitate our horses by keeping their footing too easy. Um, it's the same by, by keeping not enough um, challenge in our lives because without cha- see, we grow by challenge. We, we, our horses develop the ability to be sure-footed. Um, I had a, um, a wildie that came in for, for me to start when I was training and that little creature could charge through anything. Like I'm talking the the ability to feel the ground and march was just in him innately. I never had to train him anything. Like he would charge over a tree if you asked him. He just would point and shoot. And that came because he had spent so much time learning and feeling the ground. So partly I would actually use it as an opportunity because the snow is soft. And for us, you know, the ground is not it's the snow is deep now. So, you know, that's fun. Um, But I would have you encourage, I would encourage you to look at it like another little opportunity to just test the edges of something that's slightly uncomfortable to to actually build um, more skill, build it. So obviously we're not going to go on the ground when it's sheer ice or, you know, anything of this nature, but recognize that I actually, this is a bit of an energetic um, personal perspective on life your situation is always exactly set for liberation liberation and growth like there's choice in every moment for you to take the next step towards your own growth and liberation and sometimes when it's challenging and hard oh i actually try to figure out what does it mean to go into that challenge and and play with it and just have fun with it instead of seeing it like it's like oh i'm confined i'm in a corner but if you look at it like oh this is the next moment for me to be able to step forward into the very changes that I want. Like, it's like they're right there waiting for us. And as we start challenging that a little more, rather than believing it's confining us, all of a sudden you start thinking, okay, how could we get more sure-footed? Well, maybe in some areas we need some sand on the ground. And then in other areas, maybe we play in the snow and maybe we watch how they dance and raise and engage more um, and just play around with it. So maybe you're not gonna uh, lope circles, but maybe you could work at doing other things. So anyways, I love that belief that in every once in every moment, there's an opportunity for me to, to, um, to, to be at the center of the growth that I need to step forward. You know, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it is hard for us to kind of face those things that we need to grow in, but it's this beauty of trusting our moments and just trusting it and looking and saying, okay, here's where we're at. What's next. How could I see this as the very next step I need? Um, so I just encourage you to play with it. Um, go in the snow. 
you know, you could, you can come up with lots of things. You can go for walks and, you know, challenge yourself with, with certain pieces and play with it. You know, for us, you know, when we're out working cows, um, we just go wherever, like you just go and do it. And if the horses struggle, you talk that out and you work through it and not always do you crash through something if a horse needs a little bit of help, but you keep, because, because to me, relationship is built on what they expect from me when they struggle, how I handle them. It's no different than you and I, Shannon. If, if, if When you know I'm going to hold space for you, that doesn't mean I'm going to go easy on you necessarily, but I'm going to hold space for you and we're going to do this together. See, that's what builds relationship. So it's the same with the horses. I want to expand them, which is why I like pressure. I like pressure. I like pressure on myself. I like pressure on my horses, but not to fear. See, once we get into fear, the brain's off. So that's a whole different space. That's why I love the yellow light conversations. Does that make sense, Shannon? Yeah, cool. So see your moment as the opportunity that you actually needed to step forward into the next level of your growth with your horse. It kind of changes your perspective and all of a sudden you're kind of excitedly looking at like, ooh, what could we do here? What do I, what, what is that? What is it that's right in front of me that actually represents the next step of my growth? Cool. Maya? Awesome. Uh, the next question is from Sylvia. She says, I have a new 13 year old gelding and found out he has extreme separation anxiety that affects mm -hmm. everything we do together. Mm -hmm. He even had a mild colic episode after mm -hmm. pawing alone in the trailer for about an mm -hmm. eight mile trip, one way to the osteopath. Mm -hmm. I know this will be a long road to get him through this, but what are your suggestions on where to start? Yeah, really good question. Um, <clears throat> So it kind of has two answers. And, and one is thinking about the separation anxiety. And the other is about creating deeper connections for you and him um, and, and working on developing that trust. A lot of times horses are so triggered. Like they, they get, the, our, our triggers are, are fast too. You know, when you've had something go wrong and a person talked to you a certain way and it, and it, and it created a trauma and then someone else talks to you a certain way and it triggers that experience like this is the triggering element so then with our horses in these scenarios you just start taking them away from their pen and it, it immediately triggers that whole state and it wasn't maybe you that did it but it triggers the expectation of that story and that's really where the struggle comes so there's two things to this. On the one hand, it's really deepening your ability to feel feel the tension within them in places where they are not mentally in tension so that you can feel, and this is kind of a body mapping exercise. Um, the body mapping work is a process I go through to kind of connecting with your lead rope and feeling the tension in a horse because the tension in a horse is the representation of their mental state. So when a horse is anxious, they become tense. If you can talk to the tension and you can feel the tension dissolve, it means their mind changes. So with a mind horse, if you can't feel the mind change when they're okay, it's very challenging to feel their mind change once they're stimulated. Like I, I just generally have not been able to see it. What you have to do, you can kind of make changes happen, but you have to force it. Um, you, you have to force it. So... Uh, first of all, observe that. Observe that. Can you feel? And I, I on the website we have a, a series on the body mapping, which can really give you some help. And I also have a little clip on YouTube that just kind of shows you the basic idea. So whatever works for you to jump in on that uh, to get the help there. The next thing is is you have to feel where the mental tension shows up, and you have to work where the mental tension begins. So it, with mind horses, it can it can be like you know you're ten feet from the pen. So if we blaze through that, then we're actually passing that point. So I also want to talk on that point. And what I want to do, and this is the difference, I'm not just going to stand there and wait. What I'm going to do is I'm actually connect, going to connect with my rein until I feel two things. I want to observe their eyes and ears release from the thing they're on. And then I want to feel them soften. Okay, if, if you just try to make, do circles and move their feet and do these things, their mind is still totally on there and they felt no release by letting the thought go. Okay. Now, now if they're, if you get so like you're only 10 feet away, I will connect that rain. And first I want to make sure I'm giving off an energy that they can feel safe with, but I'm not just standing there disengaged. I am wanting them to feel me. 
Okay. So sometimes I'm just going to stand there and wait until I can feel them make a change because you really have to sense where is it beginning? And when that tension comes up, can you talk to it? And then once they make a change, so number one, I want to just hold space. I'm going to wait for a softening. And I want to know if I used any kind of pressure, if I touched my lead, that I could actually see them learn that their thought changing got the release. Okay. Most of the time, we're not focusing on the thought. We're just focusing on their feet moving. Okay. And that's where the struggle comes. So you have to observe that they understood that you were actually talking to what they were thinking about. Okay. And that, that's generally where the biggest change comes. And as you become mindful of that, they start to see the change. And it it's becomes dramatic a dramatic effect. And then you go a little farther and then talk to that thought again. And wait until their thought changes, but do not just move the feet. I'm generally not a proponent. Um, uh, I generally focus on mind to feet, not feet to mind. So sometimes you could do feet to mind, but it's still you're still focusing on the mind. You're still waiting for the mind. So it's kind of a you, you could move the feet to do it. But I find a lot of times people get can get things revved up too big. So it just slow everything down, focus on the connection, wait for the thoughts and then look for the softening and then proceed. Hopefully that makes sense. This is such a good question. And and if you get to a place where they're dissociated, like it's gone, then we've gone too far for their stage of success. But you have to prioritize the thought changing. Cool. Awesome. Sweet. So many things I can talk about there, but we'll keep moving by. Yeah. Um, so Tanya Spencer has a question. She says, hi, Josh, and Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. How can I help Zach to get more strength in his right hind? This is the side he falls in on, although he is much stronger in the hind. However, when I ask for a shoulder in, a counter turn, or leg yield, his right hind is still lacking a little strength, which leads to him becoming a little tense in the back. He has improved so mm -hmm. much, but would love some exercises exercises to help him. Hmm. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit more technical. Um, so changing a little bit of gear, that's totally fine the the generally the situation comes that when so so my progression i'm generally observing the shoulder straightening the jaw rotating and as the jaw rotates observing the flow of the inside hind stepping to the center point so shoulders pull hind quarters um when the shoulder and the hind quarters are disconnected when you feel like that hind quarters doesn't have that stability often what's happening is is that you're going to either see because what's happening is, is the hindquarters is not trusting itself to step under and hold the shoulder up. Okay. And a lot of times what this does is this comes because the head is either over flexing or over bending. So you really need to begin supporting with an outside rein. So if you're doing the work in hand that you would support with the outside rein so that the head, the outside ear doesn't leave the inside shoulder. So they wouldn't bend the head way over here. They would only bend it enough that they could rotate their pole. So they can bend the neck still, but they would feel the outside rein before the head went too far. Again, what you're trying to connect is the rotation with the inside hind stepping. And then what happens is by having a more subtle bend, if the head goes too far, the hind leg is not strong enough to get under. Like if I took my head and I threw it way over here, you know, you have to be a certain level of strength to get under and pick all that up. So by keeping them a little closer to center, you want them to be soft, but don't let them bend too much, just enough to get that rotation. And then really observe that hindquarter stepping under. And the key is, is when the hindquarter steps under and both reins lighten, you know now they're activating that core center. And that's the key. You need to feel the hindquarter step under and feel the process happen. So you want the shoulder to move until you feel rotation. Then let your outside rein support so you're not getting over flexion because if the pole starts to rotate and nothing is supporting, they will rotate their pole, then they'll just overbend their neck. So that, that then now this connection doesn't get to the hind legs. So most horses I see pole rotation is actually lost in the neck. They don't actually they don't actually unlock their hind legs because they bend their neck too much. So you need very subtle neck flexion. Okay, so outside rein. Okay, start again. Shoulders, pole, outside rein. And then touch the pole until you feel the hind leg step. And you're just trying to build that connection. So this is a bit of a this is a bit of a challenge to just talk through, but you need to play around with it until you can feel the biomechanics start working together. 
Okay, so just to so observe what it is that you see that's happening. Try to find that sweet spot and feel that hind leg starting to feel like it has the confidence to step and hold and step and lift and step and lift and just ask in little doses so they don't feel overfaced. Hopefully that makes sense. Really good. Okay, Maya. <clears throat> awesome. Um, so we've got about four more questions here. Um, okay. Claudia asks back uh, towards what we were talking about yeah. earlier with Carrie. Um, she mm -hmm. said, you being a gifted trainer, Josh, how do you know which horse is meant to stay with you and be yours and which one isn't since you would be able to meet almost any horse's needs? <laughs> hmm. Uh, hmm, hmm. Oh, that's so deep. Uh, life is so fluid. Um, I have had some richly deep relationships with horses, and I believe that change is so beautiful. And every moment, see what we love to do is we love to we love to think that what is now is forever. And it's like, okay, this is, this is my horse. This is, and that's the reason why I said, guys, that when I opened this up, I said that there's horses that can connect with you and that might be a moment and it might seem rich. And what do we want to do? We generally want to hang on to that because it felt so good. We don't want to let it go. What I've learned is um, I've learned that nothing is mine. I am only a part of this beautiful space and these beautiful relationships. And what that has done is that has caused me not to believe that I can just keep something. Um, I've had a few horses that, you know, like I've had the privilege of experiencing a lot of horses in my life. And when in my early years, when I would have a horse come and I would say that they were mine, I would generally not appreciate them the same until what I did is I started purchasing horses and schooling them and schooling them with the intention of helping them find their home. As soon as it switched in my head to they may not be around, it, it richly shifted my perspective to enjoy every moment, enjoy every single moment. And this started to elevate the experiences that I had with horses because I would richly show up without the expectation of oh yeah, they're always going to be around. And, you know, I just kind of took them for granted a little bit. So what then happened is, is that it actually started to create even more rich relationships than I was having with my own horses at the moment, because I was actually showing up with way more authenticity and appreciation for each moment. And that shifted my experience with my guys. So, so I actually feel like I don't... I want, I, I love rich, true, pure relationships. I love it. I love it. That's the way I want to spend my time in my life. And I, and so that therefore I look in any moment with any horse to open that space, which then creates a space where horses want to connect with you on a heart level. So it actually creates more heart-based relationships, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are then for me to retain my whole life. And the more I release all things, connected but not attached, the richness of all of the relationships have amplified and I have been able to find so much more joy in every moment because I am not counting on tomorrow. Okay, and that's a hard thing for us is we wanna keep them forever, but that's actually an insecurity and it attaches us to what we are, like it's a, it's an, it's a negative, it's like an insecurity that it's, I have to, I wanna keep this, but then what happens is it just squeezes out our hands. So um, I want to create as many beautiful opportunities as I possibly can just to culture that, to, to have that experience. I want to not take a second for granted with my guys. I just want to be present. And then I want to trust the moment. I want to trust the moment. And if that seems like a horse is going to be, is kind of becomes flexy and in transition, then I'm just going to keep trusting that and hope that they are then being honored as they move into another home. But I, so then I never want to look back and say, oh, I wish I would have just, you know, it's so sad. I wish I would have put more time in, you know, generally looking back. I really want to look back. That would be my hope with any of them and just say, I'm so glad I, I did. I took the time. I'm so glad that I reached in, in their life and opened that space. Um, so the only horse 
that I have ever had that is is like just just has there's never been a waiver to you know the connection is max okay and i've had him since he was a weanling and he's 23 or something and there's just never been a waiver there's never been even a flex in the space that says that he might not you know we've been through everything together like that's 23 years of life that's huge um but I'm still not attached to him. I am not, I am not controlling or keeping him. He is a beautiful being that I get to spend life with and we do lots of adventurous things. Um, anyways, I hope that makes sense, Claudia. That's a really, really fun question to answer because I think it really expands on the, the present moment, like being richly in the moment with every creature that you are around because we're not guaranteed tomorrow and that creates heart-based relationships. Um, and so we're really what we want is we just want to create as many of those as possible. Um, yeah, super. Thank you so much for that question. That was great. Um, so Michelle has a question. Uh, she says, I connected with this horse I am picking up tomorrow, months ago while riding him in an event for a friend. He comes from a more dominant space training barn. So what I'm hearing you say that based on like a little while ago, Mm -hmm. um what you were talking about um i need to listen to monty tomorrow that i think that's mm. the horse's name mm -hmm. let him talk and commit to learning and listening to what he tells me any mm -hmm. other advice on his transition is appreciated mm. josh mm -hmm. wonderful yes i i want to create a certain so if a horse um Often when a horse, this is one of the, this actually uh, is a thing. It goes back to Carrie's question about horses going to new people. Uh, I don't care where the horses come from, what they were doing. I encourage people to change nothing about their gear, nothing about their bit, no, like change nothing. Because as soon as you start changing all of these things, what you do is anything the horse did feel confident in, did have a sense of awareness. You've now taken it away. And, and I, I've watched lots of horses that they just lose it. Like they, they don't, they have no, they don't feel like they know anything anymore. They don't know what to do. And so then if you want to change things, no problem, but you must do it incrementally. It's no different than us. If somebody feels like they're, you know, they know a thing and then you just throw them in this other thing, they don't have a confidence. It, this is becomes a real challenge. So number one, change as little as possible for him. And then slowly start to open up the space within yourself to feel and hear from him. And just, just like, what is it that he's saying? As soon as you start to ask yourself that question, as soon as you say, I wonder what he's saying. But, but most of the time what we say is, he's being rotten. He's being bad. You know, if you really recognize most of what we say is when they're being bad or when they're doing a thing, really we're saying they're not actually allowed to have one opinion. They can't say a thing. They have to be obedient. They can never talk. What a crazy relationship. I don't even think you can tone that as relationship. It's just submission and dominance, but we call it horsemanship. So, so it's a balance between saying, I want the horses to recognize it's important to keep me safe. Okay. It's important to have safe relationships and not throw ourselves in the deep end and then get after the horses. But on the same hand, you know, it's okay to have boundaries and, and for us all to learn what a loving boundary feels like. And then the biggest key is listen feel and then what comes up for you when you start feeling from him what comes up for you in your mind what are the things that you're like oh man it feels like this i follow it follow it it seems weird i know but you know I, i've just been it's just been happening so much for me for so many years that you know you just sit and you just open your mind and you open your space to not just judgment and you listen and the feel from the horse will come in many ways and it's just it just becomes simple so my encouragement to you is do, do all of the things that he knows do, just do what you know if it's a bridle that he uses a saddle that he uses all the things and honor him with that like oh buddy you know like yeah thank you so much you know and you do all the things even if it's not maybe what you would want to do okay then try to find connection with him and do your best to honor what he knows so if he was worked a certain way start that way just start that way but do it with the energy you want to have in the relationship just start to generally let him feel you from a place he feels honored he feels heard. He feels understood. And, and he, and he's not just getting sh his whole world shaken up because this is one of the reasons. And this goes back to Carrie's question that some of these horses lose all of it because 
too many things have been changed too too much that they can't have, they never asked for it and that's the difference so i might say yes i want to move from canada and i want to move to texas and and i and i'm absorbing the change because i asked for it that is different than if you just grab someone and you plunk them down here and they don't know what's going on and all this is different now and confidence is lost almost immediately okay so anyways find a balance in that change very little feel and listen and then just do as much as he can but in a way where you're allowing him to kind of give you thoughts and feelings and listen and you know um the whole perspective of my work is to be able to hear from a horse um connect with them and do hard things like that's kind of the, my work is how do we go out and be adventurers together um and hear each other um so i i hope that that helps michelle because that's really a big deal like how can you get on a new horse or work with a new horse and this is so fun about clinics is to be able to touch all of these new horses and feel them and let them feel heard but yet help them understand how to use their bodies and move um but always starting from where they're at so that's the first the first bit i hope that makes sense michelle that's just a wonderful question Josh, can I pop in and yeah. offer something there with the, of feel, course. the feel and listen part? Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a person in Colorado who called and asked for help with a Mustang mare mm -hmm. who was untouchable, charging teeth, mm -hmm. everything, everything, everything. And um, the listening, the listening part cannot be overstated. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean I have to know what she's saying. It mm -hmm. means I want to put myself in a presence that is listening. Right. And and humans, like you keep talking about, Josh, humans tend to do this thing where mm -hmm. a behavior happens, it results in a wave of discomfort, and then humans label it a problem and mm -hmm. want to fix it, often mm -hmm. for all the best intentions. Mm -hmm. right? Of course. But um, if for a second before, if we can catch ourselves before the mind labels it a problem, mm -hmm. and instead we go to the place where it just feels like we're acknowledging, like whatever, right. you're, of course you're stressed. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, this is stressful. I get it. It doesn't mean I have to have the answers. It doesn't mean I have to know the next step, mm -hmm. which goes right back to, you know, being in the moment with them mm -hmm. in every moment mm -hmm. so with this mayor you know i connected with her and i listened and she was just distraught her heart was in shreds because she missed mm. her family mm. and so you know we shared i shared with this person like why don't you just listen to her what it's like to have been ripped from your family mm. and you don't have to have the right thing to say you don't have to know you don't have to get it right you just show up acknowledging hmm. there is distress here hmm. right so what this woman did was go back to the mayor and actually have a chat with her and and using english because it tunes the human mm -hmm. the into honest. the feel mm -hmm. yes the mm -hmm. feeling of honest and mm -hmm. so this woman went back to the mayor and said sweetheart i am so sorry you've lost your family you're right hmm. it's not fair at all tears started mm -hmm. dropping from this mare's eyes and mm. the next day it was a different life mm -hmm. so you know obviously not everybody's situation is that intense mm -hmm. right but in the subtleties of it horse the horse is like okay often they do have a sense great i'm mm -hmm. i'm moving to something else show me what's you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. show me what's coming um but that doesn't mean they're not also missing their friends and right. it, it doesn't mean the humans are evil it means there is discomfort to acknowledge right. and when we can can be in that moment and offer our heart simply yeah. because things are happening right horses feel that spaciousness mm -hmm. and they feel that honesty and that purity mm. right and it comes we develop it by noticing the point at which our own you know thinky town just before we go into calling something a problem or wanting to fix it yeah wanting, there it is eh? mm -hmm. wanting it to be different than it is mm -hmm. you catch yourself just before that wanting that's where we can just that's being in the moment that's being mm -hmm. right with what is and that's where we can offer that that spaciousness of a magic relationship where the mm -hmm. horse goes oh. mm -hmm. all right well how are we going to do this then 
you know, totally. and that, that's a beautiful spot. So thank you for yeah. letting yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, that's share. awesome. Just unpacks that space more of, of being connected to the moment and hearing and feeling and being but not sensing you have to fix something. And that's a big challenge, like horse training, you know, it, it's not, we don't call it horse being, you know, we, we call it horse training. It's like, we need to train, we need to do something. I should be fixing this. I should be doing something. And generally a lot of times all, you know, I find myself a lot of times just showing up being myself and a lot of the problems start dissolving because they didn't actually need to be fixed. They just needed to be felt and heard. And is that not the same with all of us? Like, how beautiful does it feel when you just feel heard? Most of the time, you're there's all this tension and pent upness, and it comes bellering out. Blah, 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 blah. And when someone hears you and feels you, and then all of a sudden the tears come, and then it's like, oh, because that's really all we wanted. So there's so that's always a beautiful beginning point to just start with that. And you were never going to go wrong by just feeling that and, and boy, unpacking the whole system of training, we can sometimes think we need to train over a thing where we just need to be present in a loving space and not need to fix anything because sometimes it's not about fixing anything. It's just about that. You know, my wife has taught me that, man. There's so many times we're talking and the, it, she is not, she doesn't want to be fixed. She doesn't want to be, she doesn't want me to give her solutions, you know, you know, and boy, that would be my deal. Oh, I want to, fix her. I love her. I want to fix it. No, you know what? And there it is. Just be with me and listen, you know, and it's so the heart, I think we can all kind of resonate with that. It's beautiful kind of to progress that to our horses. So good. Okay. Maya, where are we at? Um, I think we've got about two questions left. Okay. And we could keep going. You betcha. All right. So Darlene asks, how do you handle a horse that is difficult to deworm? I'm curious about your mindset, energy, awareness, and also physical mm. technique. Please mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's something about a horse's head from a training perspective where we just kind of want to get it done, you know, and whether it's bridling or, you know, we want to hurry and we want to spend, you know, kind of create this get it done mentality. Um and it's a it's a real big piece um, that first begins in us that as we present ourselves and connect, you always have to be mindful of the energy you're giving a thing. So for kind of, you know, and it doesn't take long for a horse to struggle with a thing for us all of a sudden to start putting a negative vibe into it. So then we're amplifying the anxiety for the horses as we bring the wormer or whatever. Um, so the, the first step is making sure that as you're thinking of that thing, that you're pouring a beautiful feeling over it of even a sense of how it would feel to not have worms. As weird as that seems, like you're giving off a vibe of like, this is really gonna be very helpful. You might not be able to process that, but it's very helpful. But, and then don't get caught up in the reaction. When the horse is struggling with the thing, can you still retain the feeling of how comfortable that's gonna be while they're struggling? Because see, now your energy gives them an anchor. So that's number one. It's weird, I know, but it's really very important because they can feel you and you become the anchor. But if you're always bothered and upset or uh, uh, now they have no bearing, they have no energetic bearing. Okay. The second is it's absolutely imperative that you can help a horse understand how to follow a feel. When you connect with the rain, they, 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 you need to be able to talk to the tension because if you can't replace the tension with release and help them understand how to control the pressure of the wormer in a way where it's not about bracing and resisting, they will not change. Okay, and then before the wormer, you have to be able to connect, feel them soften. And then if you brought a little pressure to them, something that would create a little tension, and then they soften, can you then take that away? So they start learning, if I think and soften, that we can have conversation here, okay? And then what I'll do is I'll take the wormer and I'll have it in my hands. And then I'll just, you know, listen to where the spot is that if you come, you know, there'll be a bubble around the horse's head and you connect and then you bring the wormer and oh, there it is right there. And then I'm going to wait. I'm going to ask them to soften. Then I'm going to just gently relax my wormer. And then what happens is inevitably it doesn't take too long and you can get a little closer before you find that spot. But if you keep honoring them where they hear, where they struggle with it and you connect and you release as they get a little closer, 
it doesn't take very long and your hand is now almost touching them. And then you touch them and generally that brings up a big tension again. But I actually hold the wormer, um, like if this is the wormer, I just hold it in my hand and then I'll put the back of my hand on the side of their face. So I have the wormer. And then what I can do is I can actually just turn my hand and let, let it touch them. But I can roll my hand around quite simply. And then depending on what they feel, because there's so many feels, so many sensations. Okay. And then I'll get to a place where I actually will just put my finger in the side of their mouth and ask them to soften, wait, and then take it away. So as they soften, I'm not just jerking my hand away. I want to get to a place where they'll soften and wait. Okay. Then with the wormer in my hand, this is weird, um, like this, soon I just push that the the nose the the neck of the wormer up a little bit and now i'm like this and i just put that on the side of their mouth and if you can this is a little bit technical too but now the wormer is on this part of my finger and i'm holding it with my hand then what i'll do is i'll just push my finger into the corner of their mouth but now the wormer is also going in but they're feeling me support them you see I'm not necessarily trying to trick them. I'm just wanting them to sense that that I'm taking care of all the pieces. And and by the time you're doing this, you should have already been able to feel like you could just gently put your finger in. But they know when they soften and wait, then you'll take it away. And what happens is you start building space of patience because they know it's going to go away by waiting. Now, if they really freak out, okay, we overdid it. But if that happens, it means you didn't listen somewhere along the way where they were telling you they were worried and they were talking to you about it, but we didn't necessarily hear them. Okay, so that's a little bit of a spot where if you can deal this and you can listen where the tension comes up and you work your way through, generally it doesn't take very long. Um, and then slowly what you do is you get to a place where you're able to kind of gently put that wormer in and they're waiting in patience. And most of the time that's when people get greedy and they're like, okay, here it is. And now we got to just shove it in. It's like not any different than loading horses in a horse trailer. You know, it's like, oh, they're right there. Close the door. And then all of a sudden, all the work. Now they're like, ah, you've turned it into something weird. Just keep taking your time. And what you can practice with is actually practice with a wormer, like a wormer container when you're not worming. Like, isn't it funny how, when do we work on worming our horses? When we need to worm them. Like, well, that's sucky training, but we all do it. You know, like all of us generally start working on that right as we need to worm them. And if you can kind of pull it off, some horses are fine and some horses are not. But man, what a great thing to work on, helping your horses to think under pressure, but just in this general form. Um, and then slowly you'll just push a little bit in. You know, you can push the whole thing, depends on the horse. And, and generally once the horses understand that they can control it, they don't need to. And I, uh, this example to me is a training principle, but I use it like if we were all in a barn, Okay. And all the doors are up and everybody's sitting calmly. Okay. And then if we're sitting there and all the doors are closed now, but you all know you can get up and leave, you're probably not going to go check the doors. But if all of a sudden when we're sitting there, we hear these people running and yelling and they're locking us in. Okay. Everybody would probably try to get out. So the reason you try to get out is because you have no understanding of how to go through the process. But if you know you're free to go whenever, and if the horse braces, that's fine. You can brace. But they understand there's another option and that a little bit of patience allows for that option. Pretty soon, they don't care. Like you can pretty soon worm them without a halter on. It's not the end of the world, but if they have to understand. So anyways, I would encourage breaking it down, finding a balance, um, and then working on that soften to pressure and then them understanding that they could actually deal with the pressure through the release. And the key is, Find the spot they're talking to you. Find the spot where the tension comes up because that's when the horse's opinion is being demonstrated in a way they're still online. When tension comes up, the horse is still talking to you. But the problem is when tension comes up, they're still not throwing their heads. They're still not you know, running off. So we just pass right through it. As soon as you pass through that tension point, you're no longer listening. You're taking what you want. The horse feels taken. That's like those doors getting slammed shut. And now everybody's looking for an exit. Okay. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. That's a really great question. All right, Maya, what's next? Okay. Uh, Tanya has another question. She says, and another question on my two-year-old gelding. Some days I really struggle to get any clarity with him. He's very big and intimidating. And if mm. I ask him to move off when, for instance, mucking the paddock out, mm. he rears right up at me. I just walk off. 
but then he follows and will run past and kick out. And mm-hmm. other days when I work with him and believe in what I am doing and work on keeping my energy at a low level, mm-hmm. as he is super sensitive to the point where I can't at the moment use a flag as it makes mm-hmm. him explode. Um, I'm not trusting him at all. And we're just <clears throat> not connecting. Not mm-hmm. sure where to go from here as I really need hands on help. So first thing is you have too many mindsets around how this interaction has to happen. So your desire is that he would quietly respond to your space and that in his hoarseness, he would not express himself this way. But it sounds like he's a horse that is going to be extremely expressive. And you're going to love that when that expression is working in your extended trot or your piaf and your passage. You will love that he is vibrant and vivacious in his movements. You will love it. But right now when he is engaging every little thought, it seems very overwhelming. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to put no attachment to how he responds. I want you to calmly build the boundaries that you need, calmly help him. And when he does this and he gets big, I just want you to go there with him, like love it, have fun with it. And But yet make sure that you're giving enough clarity at a distance. And if he needs to do a thing, let him do a thing. It's okay. He's a baby. Nothing in his mind, nothing in his mind has ever understood that you need to act a certain way. Okay. Babies, especially, this is why guys, the beauty of being a child is some of our most favorite memories. We just got on our horses and we did what? Whatever came to us. We just got on and sometimes sat backwards and had four friends on and went running up the hill. And because we just went for it, we had no structure. And so these horse babies, especially when they're bred to be beautiful, big movers with lots of energy, We love the finished product, but then all of a sudden, all of the parts that build this can seem overwhelming when they're not settled. So what my encouragement to you is have fun with it, build your boundaries, do whatever you need, but he is trying to talk to you and wants to. The challenge is we want everything to be quiet and small, but what he wants you to do is show up. He wants to feel you in those interactions and he has a spatial element. He also has that pressury element. But I think he doesn't like it when you walk away because that wasn't what he was working at. He's like, I want to talk. Let's talk. But he also doesn't know he's not supposed to have that alive response that him showing you how beautiful he is and how powerful he is is bad. He doesn't know that. And, and you got to recognize nobody's informed him of this. And uh, my desire is not to inform him that his brilliance and his beauty and his majestic energy, he's trying to let you feel him. You know, he's like, look at me. And, but because we associate some of those things to fear because it makes us think of, oh, it's going to go like this. Now we start telling ourselves a story over top of his beauty and brilliance and innocence. So my thing would be laugh, have fun with him, Use your space and clarity and let him feel you, let him feel those boundaries, but but not with quit or ah, but just with oh, oh, let's have fun, bud. Look at you, you're beautiful, and you're slowly building boundaries without discouraging that brilliance and beauty. But you can still be very clear with your space, and you know, there's certain areas where we need to be safe because he doesn't know that it's not okay to kick you, like he's just. In, in his own thing with horses, they kick each other. So you have to have some boundary, but you don't have to let that charge anxiety in you. And, and the other thing is, is that this is a challenge with kind of the relational work is we think everything should be quiet. Everything needs to be small and quiet. And if it is, we're doing really well, but I disagree. Relationship is that you are free to be you. I am free to be me on like a, a richly open level, but we also consider each other in the relationship. Okay, but most of the time with our horses, we want them to do exactly what we need. This is not pure relationship now. Okay, this is very one sided. And for him, he wants to be with you. He wants to engage with you. So I don't want you to tell him that that is wrong. But I also want you to be very clear with your space, but enjoy him. And when he stands on the back of his legs, you tell him how look at you, my boy. Let him feel because he's trying to impress you. He wants you to feel him. And you see, if you just change your perspective, you know, and you and you work towards um, kind of finding a new picture around him, 
I'm amazed actually at how quickly things settle. Okay, Carrie just said it. When we're seen and we feel heard, things settle. Okay, so I just want you to experiment with that. But on the same hand, I want you to be brilliantly confident with your space. Brilliantly confident that it's very clear that where he can be him and where it is that it's too close. You know, that that because he doesn't know these things. Someone needs to mentor him. But on the same hand, that doesn't then need to turn into uh, the sense that you're losing relationship because you're not. You're actually inspiring it and creating it and shaping the energy. You see, and this is what needs to come. It's just like a tornado of energy. And slowly you begin to shape and shift and adjust. So it needs strength and confidence, but it also needs a liberation and a vulnerability in you that you don't need to control him to be okay. Okay, I, I just want to let you wrestle around with those thoughts, Tanya, because they're both, you know, they're both the balance of this, the yin and the yang of allowing beauty and uh, the brilliance of this energy to be in relationship with you without feeling confined. Let him be a baby. Cool. All right. All right, Maya, uh, where are we at? Is that good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there okay. was one other question, but I'm not sure we're pretty long on time now. Um, uh, on last one, if there's one more, and we'll stop there. <laughs> okay, last one. So Tom says, Josh, are the traits of mind pressure and space fixed or are they influenced mm. by the human too? Good deal. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, we, we are so influenced by what we spend time with. So if you spend time with a person who is very critical or judgmental, it's very challenging for you not to start kind of looking at life that way. Um, if you spend a time with, you know, so, what, so whatever you're energetically around, you will be influenced by, it takes a certain level of mental uh, attunement to get to a place where you can be around things and allow them to be what they are and not necessarily take those things on. So absolutely. If a person is around a horse, that's pretty chill, but you're always uptight about things, you know, you can kind of start a, like dialing up the horse's uncertainty and awareness of the world. And you can also be a calm presence and cause the pressure and mind side to, to relax. So absolutely. And it's this beautiful, this is the beautiful marriage of relationship is that it is, it is, a, it is an organ in itself. And we will in moments be blessed by this and in other moments learn. Okay. And I don't want to say cursed because I don't think of it that way. It's not like that. It's just that boy, they will challenge you to learn. Um, and so absolutely mind space and pressure are not fixed. They are alive. There are certain pieces that are a little bit more innate for every horse. But my goodness, can you, I watched some people, I had a clinic one time and I'll finish on this, where I had a lady that was a very up energy kind of person and she was riding an Arab. And then I had another lady who was riding a quarter horse and she was very chill and relaxed. And, you know, and as you can imagine, the lady riding the Arab was looking for information about slowing her Arab down. And the lady on the quarter horse, oppos opposedly, was looking for ways to encourage her quarter horse to move. And they were very good friends. And so what I did, I just switched them. I just changed. I just put them on. And, and it didn't take it didn't take 10 minutes. And this quarter horse was just starting to pick himself up and wanting to go. And this lady had this horse cantering around in no time. And the Arab was all of a sudden dropping his head and they didn't do anything. I didn't tell them at that point, but this was just impacted by the beautiful influence of what our energies do. And guys, this should be a lesson to all of us in the brilliance that all of our energies have and impact the world around us all the time. This was a, I wish I would have had it on film. We weren't filming stuff at that point, but what a beautiful portrayal of the value of the energy you bring to the table. So absolutely, I'll just finish on that. Um, yes, there are certain kind of natural attributes, but then there is also the influence of the energies you spend time with and the power of your own energy. Your tendencies are going to have influence, but then when you take tendencies and you incorporate awareness, oh, wow, now you're really starting to add some great value to almost anyone you're engagement with or you're engaged with. 
Um, yeah, so that's great. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. I hope that was enjoyable. Those were some really fun conversations, some really fun questions. Uh, I love it because it kind of, we're all over the place. Those are the best questions when, you know, we're kind of touching a bunch of people because if it's all the same, well, we'll touch a certain group, but maybe other people, not so much. So um, thank you so much. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. I hope it's a time of rejuvenation and rest. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone again in the new year. Thanks a lot, guys. And we'll see everybody later. Bye for now.